Really take your watch off before you baptize. I, uh -oh. I, I thought of everything I had, this, but I didn't think about the watch. It's okay. So I was wondering, why is my arm wet? <laughs> um, my maternal grandfather was a extraordinarily brilliant person. He was a brilliant chemist, professor, and researcher. His name was Frank Gucker of German extract. And, but my brother and I called him Kappa. And we called my grandmother Gamma, both two Greek letters. And with my grandfather's brilliance, it strangely seemed appropriate. Now, likely my older brother named uh, Gamma from trying to say Grandma <laughs> and mispronounced it, they liked it, and then they said, okay, let's, let's call the other one Kappa. Now, Kappa earned his PhD from Harvard in 1923 in aerosol chemistry. And then during World War II, he worked at Oak Ridge. 1966, he published a textbook on physical chemistry. And then during the 1970s, before the Iron Curtain fell, he was in a, a scientific exchange program with the Eastern Bloc countries, places like Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland, lots of places like that. Uh, so my grandfather Kappa was a brilliant man. And yet, even though he was sort of a giant among scientists, he spoke to my brother and I on our level. He, he lowered himself to, to speak to us and to love us as his little grandchildren. He didn't demand that we come up to his level of intellect. He didn't condemn us for not understanding uh, all his work and his vocabulary. He met us where we were. He met us on our level, and he loved us. My grandfather Kappa spoke our language, and we loved him. Now, much the same way, God does not demand that we come up to his level, but he meets us where we are. He doesn't condemn us for not understanding the physics of his vast universe or the biology of, of his creation. He doesn't demand that we come up to his level of holiness before we come to him. Rather, God meets us where we are. Through his incarnation, the second person of the Trinity, God Almighty, Jesus, humbled himself and became human and walked among us. Now, if that's not <laughs> humbling yourself, I don't know what is. And then Jesus died and rose again to raise us up to his level by giving us the gift of his righteousness, unearned and undeserved. And then on that first Pentecost Sunday, we also saw that instead of God demanding that we le learn Hebrew, the language of the Jews and the language of the Old Testament scriptures, that the Holy Spirit spoke to the people in their own language. The Holy Spirit was meeting them where they were in their own language, in their own dialect, in their own culture. He did this through the 120 disciples who were in the upper room, who were filled, empowered with the Holy Spirit. They had waited for 10 days in prayer, seeking the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, Acts 2.4 says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were speaking in other tongues or other languages. Why? Why would the Holy Spirit give them this incredible, miraculous gift that those visiting from Jerusalem, from all over the known world, might hear the good news of God's kingdom in their language, in their heart language? Now, did any of you hear those readings that were in other tongues this morning? Did you immediately understand them? No. It's like they, the, the speakers understood it, but, but the rest of us didn't. Can you imagine only speaking another language and then hearing the gospel in your heart language? 
That's good news. So all these people heard the gospel in their own language, in their heart language. Verses 5 and following tell us now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them telling in our own language the mighty works of God. Some of those words are almost unpronounceable to me, right? And, and, and yet, all that whole language, and, and they were able to hear the mighty works of God in their own language. What a gift! What a gift to be able to hear it in their own language and to get the nuances and, and, and total, totally understand what was being said. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, can you imagine someone... If, this, if you had just come to Christ, someone had told you about the good news of God's kingdom and about Jesus Christ and about salvation, you said, yes, I'm in. I want it. And then they said, great. All you have to do is learn Hebrew and Greek before your baptism. How would that sound? That'd be a bit of a turnoff, wouldn't it? But no, I mean, not, but the Holy Spirit speaks our language. He doesn't require us to learn Hebrew or Greek. He speaks in our language. That's, that's God's way to speak in our language. He meets us where we are. The Holy Spirit speaks our language. Now, for centuries, missionaries have risked their lives, spent millions upon millions of man hours and billions upon billions of dollars to translate the Bible into every language in the world, going from the original Hebrew and Greek into every language and dialect in the world. Now, there are roughly 10,000 languages and dialects on this planet. Wycliffe Bible translators and other translation groups have been working tirelessly and right now in some of the most dangerous parts in the world to make sure that every tribe, every tongue, every group hears the gospel in their heart language. Now by the year 2025, they hope to have started translation work in every single language in the world. That is exciting. That each and every person will be able to hear the gospel, not just in a language that they might know, a, a regional language, but in their heart language. So why spend so much time and money and effort and risk their lives to translate the Bible into all those languages? Because we believe that God meets us where we are. And we believe that God, the Holy Spirit, speaks our language. And that's good news. Now back in 1950, American missionary Jim Elliott followed the calling of God to go to the jungles of Ecuador to share the gospel with the AUKUS people. They had never, ever had made peaceful contact with anybody, the AUKUS. They were a primitive tribe who lived in grass huts and wore loincloths. And every time they ever made contact with anyone, it was violent. They would steal their canoes. They'd murder the people. So the local tribesmen were terrified of the AUKUS. And foreigners were even more afraid. So, yet Jim Elliott had read about them, and he felt the stirring of the Holy Spirit. He knew that he knew that he knew that God was calling him to this specific people to share the gospel. And he was going to do it no matter the cost. So, using a small propeller plane, pilots of the Mission, Missionary Aviation Fellowship flew through the AUKUS area. They went down in river valleys, and eventually they spotted them in December of 1955. They spotted them. And so they kept going over, and they were waving, and they'd get lower, and they'd wave, and eventually the AUKUS started waving back. So they dropped some gifts. And they seemed like they were sort of gaining the trust. 
Eventually, Jim Elliott and several others landed an airplane on a little spit of land in, in, in a river valley, and uh, they made peaceful contact until a few days later when they rose up and hacked every one of them to death. Now, it seemed that all their education and linguistics, all the expense, all their effort had been a total waste. His wife, Betty, grieved the loss of her husband and the father of her children, but she did not see her husband's martyrdom as a waste. Like the prophet Isaiah, who was sawn in two for his prophecies and whose prophecies were at first rejected, Jim Elliot was faithful, obedient, and successful in God's sight, even though it appeared at first glance that he had accomplished nothing. But Betty Elliot continued his, his work. She persevered. She refused to give in to fear. She refused to harbor bitterness toward her husband's murderers. And eventually, she made peaceful contact with the AUKUS. Eventually, she was able to move into one of their villages. She was able to translate the Bible into their heart language. And she was able to share the gospel with them. And they repented of their murderous ways. And they came to Christ Jesus. Was it worth it? Was it worth it to translate the Bible into their heart language? Yes, it was. Because they finally heard it and got it, and it made sense to them, and they changed their ways, and they turned to Jesus Christ. The entire story of the Elliot's life, Jim's martyrdom, and the conversion of the AUKUS people is, is beautifully portrayed in the movie, The End of the Spear. If you haven't seen it, it's a great, great movie. So why? Why did Jim and Betty Elliot commit their lives, literally, to the translation work for the AUKUS people. Because they believed that God meets us where we are. And they believe the Holy Spirit speaks our language. Now lately I've been studying the history of Islam and it's difficult, it's, it's chilling, much of it. From its inception, Islam's history has been oppressive towards women, violent toward non-Muslims, and obsessed with money, sex, and power. Islam also teaches that the Quran should be read in Arabic. Islamic schools here in Memphis and throughout the world, uh, the students teach the Quran in Arabic. Their view is that Allah doesn't meet us where we are, but through our works we must meet Allah where He is, and that we must learn Arabic to truly understand Allah. Well, this view is exactly opposite of our understanding of Christianity because we know that God meets us where we are and that God, through the Holy Spirit, speaks to us in our language, even our heart language. Now, tragically, similar demands were once required by the church. In the late 4th century, the Latin Vulgate became, well, it was published the, the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible was published and became the standard Western Bible for the Western Church. But as the centuries passed, people quit speaking Latin. They were speaking other languages. Plus, there were Germanic languages and French languages and, and, uh, and languages in North Africa and, and Egyptian and, and Arabic and all these other languages. But nobody spoke Latin anymore, but the Bible and the worship service continued to be in Latin. Very few people knew what it meant. Some of the priests memorized the Mass, but they didn't even know what it said. They just mumbled the words. And so the people, uh, in their evangelistic efforts to the tribes in the north of Europe, as they were trying to evangelize there, they were expecting them to learn Latin before they could share the Gospel. Sounds like there's a problem there. It wasn't there. It didn't work. So, so Rome was overran. One of the phrases from the Mass was hoc es corpus mam, meaning this is my body. And this was supposedly the magic moment when the bread magically was transformed into the body of Christ with no bread left. And the people knew that was the magic moment, so hoc es corpus mam became, anyone know? 
hocus pocus. That's where the term comes from. It comes from the Latin mass. Why was that hocus pocus? Because it was in a language no one understood. They were just words. They didn't understand what it meant. But this is not God's way. God meets us where we are. And the Holy Spirit speaks our language. That's why we read the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Scriptures, except for today, totally in the common language. <laughs> now, we read a little bit in a foreign language today, but we typically read the Scriptures in the common language, and we worship from the book of common prayer. We, that is, we use the common language of the people that we might worship the Lord. Now, on that first Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit came in power. And He empowered some to supernaturally speak in other tongues so people of these varying nations could hear the good news of God's kingdom in their heart language. And then He empowered the Apostle Peter to preach his first sermon so, so that thousands and thousands of people could hear. And when he preached that sermon, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the people were cut to the heart and said, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent, that is, change your ways, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then others, as time went on, Thomas went to uh, India. Uh, others went all over the known world. So they would have had to have started translating the Bible into those other languages to be able to share the gospel with them. So how does the Holy Spirit inspire Christians today to speak into the heart language of others? I don't know about you, but I've, I've found myself guilty sometimes because I know English pretty good, <clears throat> pretty well, that when somebody doesn't speak in quite perfect grammar to sort of try to maybe think they should be corrected. But, you know, that's not speaking in their heart language. If somebody doesn't speak the way I do and I want to share the gospel with them, I need to speak in their heart language, not make them come up to my level, right? So, how does the Holy Spirit inspire Christians today to speak into the heart language of others? Well, some are translating the Bible into other tongues all throughout the world. I have some dear friends that are working in Sri Lanka right now, translating the Bible into a language uh, that, that of another country, and many are doing the same. Some are supernaturally able to preach in another tongue, in another language. In fact, this happened to a missionary friend of mine. We spent time in Honduras for seven weeks, my, my wife, my daughter, and I, and the missionary couple of Thompsons that were there, Jack Thompson, said that when he first got there and could barely speak Spanish, that he was preaching a sermon once, and all of a sudden, boy, he was, he said it was just unbelievable. The, the words were coming to him in Spanish that he didn't know. I mean, literally. So for those first few months, sometimes the Holy Spirit would, would, would supernaturally give him the ability to speak in Spanish. After he learned Spanish, he didn't need that anymore, and it subsided. Um, so that happens sometimes. But all of us, all of us, as we receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us and empowers us to be faithful witnesses, the Holy Spirit can give us the ability to witness to others, families, friends, enemies, people we don't know, people of different cultures. The Holy Spirit can help us be effective witnesses. Now, from last week's reading, from Acts 1.8, this is what the Scripture says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in the area of your comfort zone. In your neighborhood, the kind of people you're used to. But then the Holy Spirit will help you to speak to those in your Judea and Samaria. That is, those beyond your comfort zone. Now, Samaritans, people who lived in Samaria in that first century, where Jesus said we were to be witnesses, Samaritans were looked down upon by first century Jews. Samaritans were spiritual half-breeds. 
They believed some of Judaism. Then they took bits and pieces of other religions and put it all together into this sort of syncretistic soup of a la carte uh, Judaism. And so they had this sort of unorthodox strain of belief. And the Jews looked down upon them for that. They were interbred with various races. They looked down upon them for that as well. So most, most first century Jews were not only uncomfortable with Samaritans, but they refused to even speak with them. I mean, if they were going from one part of Israel to the north part of Israel, and there was the area of Samaria, they would go 20 miles out of the way to avoid going through there so they wouldn't have to speak to those kind of people. Well, that's not what the Holy Spirit's empowered us to do, to find creative ways not to talk to them. The Holy Spirit has inspired us and inspires us to be able to share the love and truth of Jesus with those people that we don't normally get along with. So today the question is, who are your Samaritans? What races make you uncomfortable? What religions make you uncomfortable? These people are your Samaritans. And the Holy Spirit has empowered you to befriend them to the point that you understand their slang, their culture, their likes, their dislikes, that you can share the love and truth of Jesus to them in their way of understanding, in their heart language. So God has met you where you are, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you in your heart language. And after he has spoken to you through others, he expects you to speak to others in their heart language that they might hear and receive the good news of God in Christ. Amen. Amen, amen. amen.